But really appreciate everybody coming here. Um, I heard some great feedback from yesterday. And uh, that's what we love, actually, about uh, this conference, the fact that people come in and they have so much to collaborate with us on. So keep the feedback coming, even today. And, uh, and as we go back from here, it's not the, at the end of uh, all the discussions and the conversation. This is just the beginning. So really appreciate everything from yesterday and uh, look forward to a great session, so a set of sessions today as well. Uh, so as with all companies that aspire to become uh, meaningful and relevant over time, it takes a village. It takes a village to actually build an ecosystem of partners, uh, folks who co-create value for uh, the customers and the partners here as well. And uh, today, for the first uh, 15, 20 minutes, we're gonna have uh, three of our uh, really dear partners come on stage and talk a little bit about the journey itself. Uh, so in that vein, I wanted to call one of our um, really long-term partners for a company that's seven years of age, probably for half the age of this company, um, Alan Atkinson from Dell. Please come over, Alan. Good morning, Alan. Good morning. Uh, no, uh, not, a few casualties, I think, from last yeah, night. Yeah, yeah, I can I, see that. Probably it's 8 a.m. in the morning, and uh, it's always hard, especially after you've partied hard last night. Well, you guys do it right. <laughs> 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 so tell us a little bit about the journey itself. I know it's been uh, a few years uh, since we... You know, I think it's been about three years since, since you and I met, and, you know, pretty happy to say we've, we've actually it's become personal, right? I mean, personal relationships, personal friends. You know, I think I go back three years ago, and I've been at Dell four years, just to sort of put it in perspective. And we noticed something happening in technology, sort of in that time frame. And it was this, I don't even think it had a name at the time, right? It was this new way of consuming compute and storage in this converged, and now we call it hyper-converged fashion. And we went out and we, we looked at a number of companies that were playing around with this technology and kind of were introducing products into this space. And, you know, frankly, we found you guys. And it, it was, uh, I think it was an inch, instant chemistry. We had a similar perspective on the way we were looking at the industry, and we understood just how disruptive that was going to be. And, uh, you know, here we are three years later, right? And, um, you know, thankfully, we, we did that partnership. I think it's been great for both of us. Yeah, I think it was a serendipity as well. Uh, and the fact 300 that, people at the time, yeah. 300 people. Yeah, we were just 300 people back then, you're right. And uh, the fact that we're 2,000 now, uh, you've come a long, long way, and I think you've helped build this business as well. So really appreciate everything you've done as well. Well, thank you. Tell us about what the customers are saying and uh, what the journey has been like in the last three years. Yeah, you know, I think, look, it's been a great partnership in my mind, and I, I think anybody who looks at it would say that. If you think about it, you know, thousands of nodes shipped, 30 countries, Revenue that's you know well above expectations, well under the nine digits, right? Pipeline that's that's just exploding, and I think it says a lot about your technology. It says a lot about our technology. It says a lot about the partnership, and it says a lot about how this space is changing, right? This is this is not a zero sum game, right? This is a radically new way to consume compute and storage, yeah. and people were people were flocking to it. Very interesting term you use about uh, the zero-sum game itself and the pundits, they'll analyze the heck out of, uh, obviously, the Dell EMC integration and think of this as a zero-sum game. Tell us more about where the future of uh, this partnership is really headed. You, you know, look, first of all, that's a question I get um, about once an hour when I'm here, right? What's going to happen to this partnership? Yep. Many of you have asked me that question. Many of you have asked me that question at the session I did yesterday. And, you know, look, customers love Nutanix. Customers love Dell. Customers love the Dell XC series, which is Nutanix on, on Dell. We started out with one product. We've got seven now, right? And customers want to know what's going to happen, what's going to happen in the future. And Deeraj, I'm, I'm thrilled to say that we've reached agreement to extend our OEM relationship, and customers can buy with confidence. We're going forward. We're going to keep growing that. We're going to build on that momentum, and I, I couldn't be more excited. So say that again, I think uh, probably the audience is this. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Really appreciate uh, the level of confidence that you've actually had in us for the last three years. And it's been an emotional uh, last few weeks for the two of us. I mean, we've been talking to Michael on an everyday basis about this uh, agreement. And 
uh, it takes that it takes that kind of a courage and confidence to go and uh, and do this uh, without really thinking about this being a zero sum game. That's the way we actually grow the blast radius of what hyperconverge really means. A absolutely, we want to win, Deeraj, you. and you're an important part of that. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks. Really appreciate it. So we wanted to start the day with a bang, and obviously a lot of you uh, hopefully will fathom what this really means. You know, the fact that. As uh, two partners, we said, you know what, if you don't compete and cooperate and collaborate and cannibalize each other, then we're not going to really survive. And that survival in this uh, uh, industry is all about knowing how to compete with yourself. That's how the NX brand, which is our own uh, appliance form factor, competes with the Dell XC brand, competes with the Lenovo brand. And in, in the next five minutes, you'll actually hear us talk about Lenovo as well. But before we get there, um, let's bring on uh, stage uh, one of the people that I've actually at least heard a lot about, but would love to have him ca come and talk about uh, their journey to the cloud. Jeffrey Snover from Microsoft. So, uh, Jeffrey, this has uh, been a journey for you as well at Microsoft. Absolutely. And uh, I'm sure the audience would love to hear how companies transform from uh, delivering on-premise software to go on to really deliver things in the cloud and how the culture really moves from one to the other. And not just the culture for the consumers, but the culture of developers who actually go on to really do DevOps, carry pagers, and so on. Exactly. Yeah, you know, this is a, a time of great change. Um, and indeed, you know, when times of great change, can we go back one? Sorry. In times of great change, it's important, um, in times of great change, there are new winners and there are new losers. So in times of great change, it's very important to pay attention and to make smart choices. So what we're seeing in the marketplace is that business is moving faster today than ever before. And yet there's this conflict between the needs of the business and the comfort zone of IT. Business needs to move fast, right? It needs to be able to respond to changing market dynamics. It needs to listen to customers, respond to those customers, deploy new applications and features as quickly as possible. And yet, IT's comfort zone is a world of stability and predictability. And so there's a natural tension between these two th forces. We believe that the cloud is the way uh, that solves this tension. The cloud enables IT to have the stability and predictability they require while giving the businesses the agility and the ability to innovate at, uh, at rapid cloud pace. The cloud, however, is not a place. The cloud is a model. The cloud is not a place, it's a model. If you think about the traditional model, the traditional model was one where we had uh, well-defined, you know, dedicated infrastructure for each application. We had purpose-built hardware. Uh, we had customized procedures and configurations for each application. Virtualization did not change this model. Virtualization improved this model. It made it more agile uh, and more efficient, but it did not change the model. The cloud is a new model. The cloud leverages the magic of software to be able to provide substantially greater reliability, availability, and scalability at dramatically lower costs. How does it achieve that? It does so by leveraging new software architectures running on industry standard hardware and using standardized operations, and configurations. Now, this, these are two very different models, but it is not an either-or world. We believe that most people that deploy the cloud will also continue to deploy the traditional model, however, using virtualization. So we believe that it is not an either-or world. Now, one of the reasons why people will continue to deploy virtualization is because of complexity. The cloud is complex. There are environmental complexities. There are technological complexities, right? Now, just think about Microsoft, Azure, right? So Microsoft, just to put this in perspective, next year, Microsoft will earn over 100 
billion dollars. Okay, $100 billion. And the cloud is absolutely core to our future. Microsoft is scouring the earth trying to find the world's best software talent to hire to run Azure. And those people are working night and day and weekends, and we are still tweaking to make the cloud successful. The cloud can be very complex. So what are the chances an average IT shop is going to be successful implementing the cloud on their own? And the answer is we have some data on this. Studies have shown that over 80% of private cloud implementations are failures. So how is it that we're going to succeed with the cloud? Well, together, Microsoft and Nutanix are going to dramatically simplify deploying the cloud to make customers successful. Let's, let me step back and tell you why I think this is going to happen. I'm going to give you an, a, a little history about Windows and uh, the evolution. If you think about Windows, you can break it down into four distinct eras. Now, prior to Windows NT, server computing was really the domain of the princes and the high priests of technology. Those were the only people who could really run servers. But with Windows NT, we transformed the world. We took a great kernel, we took a great desktop experience, put them together, ran them on industry standard hardware, and produced what is called the server for the masses. With this era, now everyone could buy, deploy, and operate their own server. Transform the world, transform the world. This then brought about, there were so many of those things, it produced a new era, and that's the era of enterprise servers, right? With enterprise servers in Windows 2000, we added Active Directory and Group Policy, and all of a sudden customers could deploy lots of servers and lots of clients and manage them in a coherent way. When we added Windows Server 2003 and .NET, we created the line of business application explosion. Now everyone, again, democratizing something that was really the, the elite, uh, could only be done by the elites. Now with .NET, everyone could write and run their own mission critical line of business applications. There were so many of those, it brought about the third era of Windows computing, and that is the data center era. In the data center eras where we made the big shift, prior to this, everything was done with a local GUI or with RDPing into an individual server. With the data center era, that technology wouldn't work anymore. And so we invented PowerShell, and we got great at automation, and we improved virtualization, and we could have scale-up architectures and scale-out architectures, transform the data center. This was the technology, Windows Server 2008, 2002, uh, 12 in 2012 R2 that allowed Azure to be born. Okay, so now what we're doing is that brought about the latest era of computing. That is cloud computing. We are taking the lessons and the technology that we learned from Azure, and now we're making them available to everyone. We're putting that into Windows Server 2016, and that is the operating system that is the foundation for all of our clouds public cloud, private cloud, hosted cloud. And we're taking that and we're putting it into our, um, we're producing solutions, cloud platform solutions with Nutanix. So we have both the operating system and the solution. Uh, and once again, what we're doing here is with these uh, solutions, we are once again democratizing the uh, technology, something that could only be done by the princes and the high priests. Now we'll have cloud for the masses. Cloud Platform Solution, or CPS, uh, is Microsoft's Azure consistent technology that allows you to run virtualized workloads. Uh, Nutanix it offers you the ability to take public cloud infrastructure and run that in your data center. Together, these produce a great solution, a uh, great first step on your journey to the cloud. Cloud Platform Solution is Microsoft's proven data center technology stack. So we have Windows Server, System Center, Azure Pack, and connected up to Azure Storage. And on this combination of great software and great infrastructure, you can run your existing workloads. 
So Exchange, SharePoint, SQL Server Dynamics, and many others you'll be able to run on this uh, with an Azure consistent experience. So I started this conversation saying that in times of great change, it's important to be smart and make good decisions because there are going to be new winners and new losers and your choices will affect which one you will be. So the key question you need to ask yourself is where are we going? Are you going to stay in the era of server for the masses? Are you going to stay in the enterprise era? Or are you going to move to the cloud? Are you going to run virtualized instances on cloud infrastructure or move to the cloud model? Because if you are, it's important to realize that there are various customers, or sorry, there are various uh, partners and platforms that are of an era. Uh, they came, up, came out during an era, they did great, but then when there was a change, they didn't make the change, and we've never heard from them again. Okay? So if you're going to run virtualized workloads on cloud infrastructure or you're moving to a cloud model, you need to make sure that you have the right partners and the right platform to do so. Nutanix and Microsoft are the right partners to bring you to the cloud, and CPS standard running on Nutanix is the right platform to begin your journey to the cloud. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you for talking about the staying power and longevity that it takes to really get this done. I have one last question before sure. you actually step away. Tell us about the transformation that happened for the developers as they were shipping things on premise yeah. to you know, going and doing things every 15 days. Yeah. They were really doing this in a DevOps model in a continuous in integration fashion. Well, the first thing to realize is that it's a continuing basis, right? So we have some teams that have been doing that for years, some teams that are just starting to do that now. And by and far, it's been a great experience. You know, of course, there's the, wait, you mean I've got a pager and someone's going to call me? Satya Nadella, our fantastic CEO, has this great phrase. He says, yeah, it just turns out that when you put a pager on a developer's uh, belt, his software gets better. And it's so true. Uh, when we, when uh, you develop a service, you get much closer to your customer. You, you do have to do that, and so diagnostics get better, uh, supportability gets better, and you develop greater customer empathy. You really realize the faces behind things. You know, back in the day, you'd just write software, it would eventually produce a CD that eventually someone would buy, and, and the customer usage was pretty distant. Now it's very immediate. And yeah, they call it the obsession for the front line. Yesterday I talked about some of this stuff. I think we'll have a ton to learn from your developers as well and how they actually transition from really doing on-premise stuff to doing services. Thanks again Excellent. for coming here. Really Thanks. appreciate it. Thank you, Jeffrey Snover. And as you can see, I think companies actually go through this transformation of shipping things on-prem to really doing things in services. I have a ton of respect for other companies like that, like Adobe and uh, even Oracle doing this in the last uh, two, three years as well. Uh, every company that needs to have longevity that is, wants to stay relevant for the next 10 years needs to go through the transformation that Microsoft uh, just went through in the last five, seven years itself. Now, the, I was just thinking about uh, what partner other than Microsoft has really brought Dell and Lenovo together in the same conference. It's been Microsoft up all this while. And uh, we aspire to be another such partner that can bring Dell and Lenovo to the same stage in the same conference. And in that vein, I would love to actually get uh, our uh, partner from uh, Lenovo, uh, Radhika, uh, f on stage. Radhika, please come on board. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, Radhika. I know uh, we met uh, yesterday for the first time. That's but, right. Uh, I know you've done a lot of uh, stuff at uh, HP and NetApp and Cisco in the past, so you really have an experience from networking, storage, and servers as well. So yeah, it looks like it was right. just befitting for you to really take over the converged solutions, converged infrastructure position at Lenovo itself. Yeah, that's right, Deeraj. Um, you know, there is definitely, as, as everybody talked about today, you know, there is a big transformation happening in the industry which is this consolidation of storage, compute, and networking to deliver higher levels of efficiency. And it's, it's great to be at the cusp of all that. Uh, I, we believe Lenovo is particularly well poised to take advantage of this inflection. Um, you know, we have no legacy business. 
Uh, we have disrupted the PC industry in the past, and we're looking forward to doing that in the enterprise space as well. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, I was learning about Lenovo about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were some great statistics that uh, at least uh, people talked about, how it took the IBM ThinkPad business about 10 years ago and made it better quality mm -hmm. and reduced uh, manufacturing costs as well. Exactly. Looks like there was a similar handoff that happened from IBM about 18, 24 months ago, right? About with the uh, series System X itself? Yeah, that is exactly right. So Lenovo acquired the IBM X86 assets about uh, 18, 24 months ago, and it's been well assimilated now. Uh, we're actually looking to take this to the next level. So, you know, obviously there's been a lot of talk about next generation IT, hyperconversions being a key ingredient of that. Uh, but there is uh, clearly a lot of focus around ensuring that we're delivering that kind of cloud economics, the speed, the agility that the customers are looking for. Yeah. I think in, uh, just like every large company, Lenovo is going through a big transformation as well. I hear there are like two headquarters, uh, one in Beijing and the other one is uh, Morristown in uh, North Carolina. That is right. Actually, we're, we're headquartered in, in two continents, uh, one in Beijing, as you rightly pointed out, another in Morrisville and in, in Raleigh in the RTP area. And uh, how are the cultures really assimilating? How the, you know, two the IBM culture and the Lenovo culture coming together? Um, it's actually very interesting because I believe IBM brings a very rich heritage of innovation. Uh, Lenovo brings a great culture of execution. And uh, so we've been able to leverage the, the, the pros of both. And uh, what you see really is, you know, you talked about insurgent forces yesterday. And that's what you really see within Lenovo. It's that hunger to win. It's that desire to succeed. So tell us about the last two quarters. We've been doing business for the last couple of quarters ever since we announced our partnership. How did the thing look like, and uh, where do you see the future going from here? There has been an amazing amount of traction, Deeraj. I'll say that. Um, you know, just in the last six months we've been in the market, uh, we've, we've seen a huge amount of interest from customers on a worldwide basis. Um, you know, we have now earned customers across the globe, uh, some of them fairly large um, enterprise customers as well. And uh, the real value proposition, you know, as you talk to them, as you dig deeper into what the motivation is to buy the Lenovo HX platform, um, oftentimes what we hear is they like the innovation, you know, the value that the Nutanix software brings and the reliability and the manageability advantages that the Lenovo platform provides. Um, so just, just as an example, you know, we have uh, some fairly large customers here in the U.S. You know, there's a large cable company that bought into our uh, value proposition. You know, we have a large, uh, several large financial services customers um, in Asia Pacific as well uh, that, that truly see much lower TCO with the hyperconverged Lenovo offering compared to, you know, legacy platforms, you know, the piecemeal uh, storage plus compute that they used to deploy before. Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at the uh, first two quarters, and it was so reminiscent of the way we went to the first two quarters of Dell as well. So uh -huh. thank you again for the journey, the partnership, and looking Absolutely. forward to a great Our pleasure. Uh, partnership. Thanks thank you so much, Radhika. Here. So with that, uh, I come to one of my uh, favorite sections uh, for, uh, for the day. Uh, the person that I've learned so much from, Mark Leslie. I met him uh, six years ago in August of 2010, and uh, he has been a great uh, force for this company, and it's really a force who's uh, helped us uh, gain courage and, and uh, think about disrupting large incumbents. Uh, I think one of the people that I have personally really learned from and I'm, I'm so indebted to, I mean, they, whenever there's been a question about uh, should we go and do something that's as big, as, as risky, and, and so on, and Mark has been that source of strength for me personally as well. So without further ado, Mark Leslie. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And Mark needs uh, no introduction, but uh, I'm sure you know, we can talk about Mark uh, being the co-founder and CEO of Veritas, which uh, has its arc of its own life now, looks like, as a separate company. <laughs> And uh, you were also one of the first board members at VMware as well. Yes. And uh, from what legend might have it, there was also 
uh, some talk of Veritas acquiring VMware in the very early days. Yes, there was. Wow. So, you know, Mark was going to talk about the arc of life, how companies really disrupt themselves and go on and do to second and third and fourth acts. So thanks, Mark, for really doing this. So um, I've been in the technology business longer than most of you have been alive. I've been in the technology business for 50 years. I joined the technology business in 1966. Joined IBM at that time. Um, and over the years, I kind of observed companies come and go. And as you see companies come and go, sometimes companies endure. Sometimes they stay, they live on. Uh, not just live on, but they live on being relevant. Now, uh, Deeridge mentions that I teach at Stanford, and one of the things that you do when you teach is people ask you questions and you need to explain things to people, and when you explain things to people, you rephrase it 52 times and you, know, you keep trying to you know, add something to it, and sometimes out of that falls an idea that you can kind of put into a framework, and that's kind of what we have today. And so this, talks, this, this presentation is about how do you build, not how do you build a company, but how do you build a company that sustains, that endures, that stays, that stays over time. So we look at the corporate life cycle. Um, you know, this is, the, this is the good part over here. You have a startup, you have this, you know, typically very high growth stage, you have this early maturation, and then companies move into the dark side, late maturation, decline, and death. And we've all seen companies come and go and die. Um, so one of the variables that matters here is time. Some companies come and go in the blink of an eye, and some companies take 100 years to come and go. But com companies tend to come and go. And they come and go, you know, the thing that drives this thing is uh, market forces. Uh, you know, that would be something like uh, Uber and taxis, uh, taxis being disrupted by Uber. Uh, political climates, uh, things like the tobacco industry was profoundly changed to the political climate in the United States. Uh, economics, um, the Great Recession of 2007 and the crash of Lehman changed the life of a lot of companies, particularly in the financial industry. And popular trends. Uh, one of the trends that we see every day in our life is mobile versus desktop and web. Uh, and we've seen that be a consumer-driven choice that has changed the industry. So all of these things happen, and over time, they affect companies. So um, many companies traverse the arc of life. And let's talk about, first of all, Kodak and Polaroid. Um, there was never a time, uh, there was never a place you could go on this globe that you couldn't find a little kiosk with some little yellow boxes, you know, from Kodak. Kodak uh, figured out um, all of the things to do with digital photography before anybody else in the industry. They had all of the patents, they had all the inventions, and they died. And they died a kind of a very ugly death. They couldn't even sell their patent portfolio. And Polaroid was, of course, put out of business by the fact that you know, the one thing they had in life was instantaneousness. And that got also subverted by the digital revolution. Uh, and these companies did not survive. They just basically went over to the dark side and to, and to death. Um, but they're not alone. Um, they've got a lot of company out there. Uh, there's a lot of names that you guys, probably a lot of you guys have worked for these companies, you know, they've come and gone. Uh, and uh, if I had a slide that was 10 times the size, I could fill it up with names, I promise you that. Um, so some companies actually transform, and that's kind of an interesting thing. Some companies actually survive. And I picked Nokia as uh, kind of an interesting case. They began as a paper mill in Finland in 1871. So they're 150 years old. They evolved into a rubber manufacturer. Uh, they evolved into the telecom market. I don't know how you get from paper to rubber to telecom, but whatever. Uh, they entered the mobile, they entered and came to dominate, dominate the mobile phone business. So they had these amazing transformations. Uh, and they built this really, really big and successful company. And uh, after a catastrophic loss in mobile phones, as it changed, to smartphones, uh, they ended up selling the division to Microsoft. Now the interesting question is with their culture. This is a deeply embedded culture of 150 years, a culture of transformation. Uh, will they and can they actually transform and rise again? And so this is a company that I'm gonna go, you know, kind of keep my eye on and see what happens to them. And I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll find a new way to do this. 
So um, one of the things that's going in, uh, one of the things in, in the world we live in today that time is compressed. You know, it's kind of like the theory of relativity. The faster you go, it actually compresses time, right? Uh, and the life cycles of these companies are now compressed. The, you know, you could used to be able to build a company and have a 50-year lifespan. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, very, very rapid technological change. You know, you know all this stuff, computers, robots, cloud, big data, deep learning, all kinds of things. There's 50 more, you know, items we could put there. Very, very rapid uh, innovation in business models. One of the revolutions that's going on today uh, is that people are taking really, you know, technology has now become very simple to do and applying it to old businesses and disrupting them in new ways. Uber, Airbnb, these are really interesting examples of those things. Um, and I would say that only the paranoid and more importantly, only those who transform uh, will survive. You have to both be paranoid and be willing to actually do something about it. So how do you create a new opportunity? You have this little life cycle in front of you, uh, and you're sitting there and looking at it, and uh, what you have to do, um, my experience personally, is you have to go build a new arc. And building a new arc means that you have to go take some risk, and you have to do some new things, and you have to transform in ways that oftentimes are uncomfortable. Um, there is a sweet spot of optionality, and one of the, when I was developing this idea, an idea like this, you know, I probably spent three years thinking about this, and one of the things that I came away is, is uh, you know, one of, the, one of the most important insights is there actually is a sweet spot. Uh, the sweet spot says uh, that you can look at a point of maximum optionality. And what we mean by maximum optionality, if you look at the point in time when uh, you're least likely to be thinking about it, least likely to do anything about it is the time when everything is going great. You know, you're growing, you're making money, you're hot. Uh, you know, you look like Nutanix look this morning, right? We saw all these great uh, partnerships and everything like that. Um, that's the time to actually be thinking about who you're going to be in five, seven, nine, ten years from now. That's the best time to do it. And as you move away from this maximum point of optionality, point of maximum optionality, it gets harder and harder and harder. So when you're a startup, you can only do one thing. You either live or die in that one thing. And as you start to mature as a company, it becomes harder and harder to do it. And once you get to the downside, once you get to the dark side, once you get to the decline in death, there's no resources. There's no money. There's no human resources. There's no reputation. There's no uh, currency to buy other companies. There's nothing. You have no resources. And you're basically laying off people and shutting factories and things like that. Um, so suggest a, a successful transformation strategy can actually create a new growth strategy. So you not only go do it once, but you do it more than once. And if you make that who you are, if you make that your identity, then you have the opportunity to create a brand new trajectory for your company. Now let's look at some uh, examples. Um, Oracle is a, is a truly, you know, I spent a lot of time like looking at doing the survey and thinking about companies and said, who's, who's a poster child for this? And Oracle is a great example of this. A very strategically driven company. So um, it was founded as a software development, as a company called Software Development Laboratories. They spent a lot of time uh, consulting, looking for product market fit. Uh, they ended up in, this, uh, in the 19, early 1980s in the relational database wars between them and about five other companies. Uh, and their strategy was to be on every platform and therefore to go capture the what was called the ISVs at that point in time, people who then built on top of their stuff. And it was a very, very successful strategy. Um, so uh, if you look at their arc, they were in the database business. They were successful. They, they, they vanquished their competition. They became dominant. And then they looked around and said, so now what? Where to from here, right? And they basically decided to get into the client server ERP applications business. Now, this is an interesting decision they made because the, this is the business that drove their business. They basically declared war on all the people that were pulling them in the market. They declared war on SAP, on, on PeopleSoft, on Siebel. They declared war on all these guys and said, we're going to go do what you do, and we're going to use our own database, even the ones you're using, right? So this was an extraordinarily 
courageous thing to do. This, is, this, was, this was tremendously risky and tremendously courageous. And they won. Um, they then uh, went and did a hostile takeover of uh, PeopleSoft. Uh, they did a roll-up of the enterprise applications. They really changed the, 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 um, uh, the kind of character of our industry uh, by doing so. Uh, and uh, they, it was the first time there was ever a hostile takeover in Silicon Valley. Uh, and they kind of rolled up this whole thing. Now, Veritas at the time, excuse me, Oracle at the time they did this, had never actually bought anything. They spent 25 years never buying anything. And then they became, they rolled up the entire industry. Uh, they went on to do an acquisition of Sun Microsystems in the hardware business uh, and became a system, full systems manufacturer. And uh, today they are, of course, uh, you know, driving uh, into the cloud like everybody else. So if you look at Oracle, they really had like at least five transformations. And as a result of that, they are a relevant, important, meaningful company in the world today. Um, little sidebar, Sun Microsystems, I just mentioned them. They were in the workstation business. Uh, they went into the file server business. They went into the dot and the dot com business. Uh, they went into the mainframe replacement business. This is a great company. And then they had an opportunity uh, to transform themselves into a software company. They had the best operating system software in the world. And if they had said, OK, instead of being, you know, you know flogging our, our hardware, we're going to go out and make our software the best there is, their, their version of Unix, there'd be no Linux today. So they basically missed the opportunity uh, to make another transformation, and they went over the edge. Um, one more you know, little picture of arcs of life. We look at Amazon. Uh, paper books to ebooks and readers to uh, all products to merchants um, to uh, other devices, you know, things like uh, Kindle Fires and Echoes, uh, and finally to Amazon Web Services. I mean, an amazing company in terms of the new businesses they've gone into and the things they've done. And of course, my, you know, this comes from my own kind of background. Uh, at Veritas, we were a company that was transformative. Um, and the reason I was able to see this is because I actually lived this. So Veritas was a startup in a different business, and uh, I was on the board of that company and stepped in as CEO of the transformed company, the new company. Went from being a systems manufacturer of fault-tolerant systems to a software uh, uh, systems company uh, in 1989. It was a, it was a restart. Uh, we had some you know, great years as, in that business. Uh, in 1997, we entered the... Uh, the backup market for the first time, um, and uh, that was for us a courageous move. We acquired a company of equal size, gave away a third of our shares. We're a public company. Um, as a little sidebar, our, our uh, Wall Street thought it was a terrible idea, and our stock went down by 65 percent. But uh, after we we were 36, they were 36 million. We put the two companies together. We shed 20 million. But we finished the year at 120, so we were, we were right on that. We transformed the company again. We, went, we were a pure Unix company, went into the NT market in 1999 through another uh, uh, very, very risky acquisition. Uh, and uh, I left the company at the end of 2001. We were a billion and a half at that point in time. If you look at the, you look at the arc, if you look at the life of Veritas, it was, it's noteworthy that it took us seven years to get to 36 million. It took us five more years to get to a billion and a half. So it was really, and that was in, the, in this kind of transformation mode that we were in. And I have two pictures over here. I have the picture of Veritas on the right. That was our original logo. And then on the lower left, Veritas has reemerged now, and they have a new logo. Uh, and uh, I actually like the new logo better than the old logo. So there you go. So this is all about, uh, it's all about leadership. Uh, what, what makes a company, you know, go one way or the other way. It's all about leadership. Uh, and it's about the style of leadership of the CEO. And I think there's two styles. I think there's a style called operationally driven. Um, it's about operational excellence, efficiency, consistency, process, being relatively risk adverse, what we call a professional manager. And one of the things about professional managers they tend to have a short time window. If you go look at many companies that have succession plans, they basically have a CEO, they groom somebody, that person becomes the CEO, 
and their horizon is five years, seven years, and then there's gonna be someone else to take over after them, maybe 10 years. They don't really think of it the way Larry Ellison thinks of it. Larry Ellison thinks of Oracle as a lifetime venture. He thinks of it as he is Oracle, Oracle is him. And professional managers don't think that way. And so they are what I call operationally driven. Then we have opportunity driven managers, uh, leaders, CEOs, visionaries, driven, creative, uh, willing to take risks, risks that are thoughtful and prudent, entrepreneurial, and they want to build a legacy. They want to see, you know, for better or worse, they want to see their name up in lights. They want to get credit for the creation of something that lives beyond them. And maybe it's narcissistic, but it is part of the drive of these people. So what can we do? How can we have impact on the world? If you're a board of directors, that's typical board of directors over there. You guys know what a board of directors looks like, right? I see you go walk in the room, that's what they look like, right? Uh, so if you're a board of directors, uh, you want to have a CEO succession that you want to consider the future direction of the company. Is it a company that you want transformation or is it a company that you want consolidation? Now, some companies might be kind of like really messy and you need someone to kind of get order and stuff like that. Uh, if, you want to tra if transformation, you may want to hire from the outside rather than the inside uh, and seek a transformative leader. Uh, you probably want to take some risk there. You want to establish a long-term strategic plan to, to, for transformation, that you, that you make this central to who you are, that we're going to transform the company. Uh, you want to keep your cash. I'm going to get back to this in a second. Uh, and when making bold moves, you want to stay the course. I, I was just listening this morning uh, when uh, Microsoft was up on stage and they make the observation that Microsoft is a, a perfect example of leadership styles. Uh, Bill Gates was an entrepreneur-driven, you know, legacy-driven guy. I would call Steve Ballmer uh, a professional manager. Let's just keep the ball rolling and make one quarter after the next. And there really wasn't much that happened over there. And I think under Satya Nadala, I think this company is resurgent now. I think they are actually doing things that we have not seen before. Uh, and I'm uh, very, very optimistic about their future at this point in time. And I'm glad it wasn't too late. It looked like it was too late, but actually you can make a difference. Now, let me get back to keeping your cash for a second. Uh, we live in a world today with what we call activist investors. And when an activist investor shows up on your doorstep, what they really want to do is either sell the company or take your cash. Um, I'm here to tell you there are no investors out there. There are traders. Every person that calls himself an investor keeps one finger on the, on the sell button. And anytime he decides he doesn't like it, he hits the button and he's gone. So when an activist investor comes in and they want to come in and take your cash, they basically say, okay, you're going to do a share buyback. Uh, the stock's going to go pop a little bit. You're going to get rid of your cash. And when the stock pops, we're going to hit the sell button and leave. And what you've accomplished at that point is you've given away your optionality. Cash equals optionality. Cash equals the opportunity to do things that you couldn't otherwise do. And you can't give away your cash. So I, I am a very, very negative on this active investor in this whole kind of world that we live in today of short-termism. You're a CEO. You are the steward of the future. You own the future of the company. The investors don't. The investors buy and sell shares, and they hope to make some money on it. But you're the one that has to worry about making a quarter, not this quarter, not next quarter, but I spent uh, you know, many, many years as a public company CEO, and if you don't worry about making a quarter in five years from now, you will not make that quarter. So you are the steward of the future, and you have to worry about that. Now, what can you do as an executive team? Now, you notice the picture of the executive team here. These are the superheroes. Um, uh, establish a five-year quantum leap strategic plan. I'm a big believer in strategic plans. You have a strategic plan. It informs your local decisions. When you have a vision of the future and you know where you're going, every day when you make decisions, you can make them that are a little bit more consistent with that future than without. So you have to kind of have a picture of the future that has meaning to you. Evangelize the vision throughout the company at every opportunity. Uh, you have to get everybody on board. You have to get everybody singing from the same hymnal. Encourage autonomous decision-making and experimentation. Uh, you have to make it high reward and low risk 
to take risk. So at Veritas, we used to, when we wanted to do something that was risky, we used to pull, pull together a team of engineers and marketing and sales and whatever and say, we're going to go try and do this thing. We don't know how it's going to work out. We're going to ask you guys to step up and do it. We're calling it an experiment. We're going to sit down in a year from now with you guys in a room, and we're going to decide whether the experiment worked or not. And whether it did or it didn't, you will be rewarded for having done this. That's kind of a mentality about getting people to step up and take risks. And you need to create a culture that wants to conquer the world. You don't want a culture that wants to just do the next thing. You need a culture that says, we want to go build something great. We want to go conquer the world. My last slide over here, I want to leave you with a thought. Uh, there is no finish line. And what I mean by this is that uh, I, I, I uh, uh, I always had this illusion. I, you know, I've been uh, I was I've been in the technology business for 50 years. I was a CEO for 21 years. I've been retired for 16 years. But I always had this idea that there was this place that once we get there, you know, it's kind of going to be easy. You know, everything is going to work out okay. We're going to get all these problems today behind us. You know, and then we're going to get to this place. That's, you know, it's going to be green and beautiful, and there's going to be flowers, and we're going to be able to sit back in the hammock, you know, we're going to be able to have a drink, and we're just going to take it easy. I never got there. And what we do is we live in this world where there's always the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And when the problems you have today and the opportunities you have today are behind you, there's new problems and new opportunities. There is no finish line. It is a, you know, and, I, and, and it's not bad. It's a good thing. I mean, I always found being... Running, running a company to be uh, relentless, but very, very addictive. You know, you really kind of get high on this whole thing. But there's no finish line. So as you think of yourself and your company, there's no there there. You're going to have to go worry about building this company over the long term uh, and, and being able to create value for your employees, for your investors, for yourself, whatever. Uh, so with that, I would like to take the opportunity to say I am greatly appreciative of being here. I have, it's been a privilege to be associated with uh, Nutanix, uh, and uh, thank you very much.